we review the week one victory over the Florida Atlantic Owls and is J.K. Dobbins basically J.T. Barrett at running back next on the OHIO podcast. Welcome to the OHIO Podcast. Two GIs and a pretty fly white guy chatting about Buckeyes and hating on Michigan. All right, boys, now give it to me. And welcome back to the OHIO Podcast. I am your host, Eric Boggs, recording live from beautiful Delaware, Ohio, down in the Buckeye basement. And joining me is my co-host from Texas, Fort Hood, I believe. Yep. That would be Mr. Aaron Brown. How's it going there, Brownie? <laughs> we finally got some rain down here. <laughs> oh, well, well, if you're over in Florida, I, I guess you're going to get a whole lot more than that. So, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, we want to say a special um, thoughts and prayers out for our, our buddy, our Michigan buddy, uh, Sean Butler there. He lives in Florida, and... Uh, I just was watching the Weather Channel before we started recording, and uh, which is hilarious, by the way. If you've ever watched these weather guys, they're like predicting the path of the storm, and it's literally like nothing but like a gazillion lines drawn out, like it could go anywhere. It's like, why are you even trying to predict this thing? It's like, I don't know. But anyways, uh, Sean, we're, we're stay safe. I know you're down there in Florida, and, and we're we're thinking of you, and hopefully everything goes all right for you. All right, guys, let's get right into this. Today's show is brought to you uh, by Mastermind. Mastermind specializes in 360-degree high-definition mobile video mapping, GIS integration, and traffic safety studies. Mastermind cares about traffic safety and keeping you safe on the roadway. Visit Mastermind at onlinemastermind.com. This week's show, our fan of the week is Bob Buck from East Ohio. His favorite Buckeye is Eddie George. His favorite Buckeye memory, he has a couple here, and he has some real good ones. Tyvis Powell interception in the end zone to secure the win over Alabama. I like that one a lot. And Ohio State's win over that team up north when it was the one versus two game of the century. That was a... That was a great one as well. Uh, Why does he love the uh, the OHIO podcast? I love the in-depth coverage you have as well as the way you cover the team from every angle. So we appreciate you listening, Bob. And this week you are our fan of the week. And today's show is dedicated to you and your fandom of our beloved Buckeyes. All right, Aaron, let's get right into it. Let's not waste any more time. We are now 1-0 on the season. It was an amazing start, and then it uh, was uh, kind of disappointing the next three quarters. What was your initial reaction following the game against FAU? Initially, I was blown away. I, I've, I don't think I've ever seen an Ohio State offense that explosive. I mean, just four drives, four touchdowns in, in big fashion, and then all of a sudden there was just this lull. I, it was it was very underwhelming for three quarters, uh, you know, and then we were outscored 21 to 17 in those three quarters. But thankfully, football games are played, you know, they're four quarters long. So you got to win all four. Um, I, I was disappointed in our line play those three quarters. Um, the pad level wasn't low enough. They were kind of getting shoved around by uh, Florida Atlantic's front seven. But to be fair, you have to give credit to Lane Kiffin because he coached his players up. They were you know, they made the proper adjustments and they, they gave us a problem. Now, I'm not sure if it was so much FAU was that good or if we kind of let off the pedal a little bit. Um, you know, it, it, it raises some questions for me. You know, did, did Ryan Day dial it back some? Did the players dial it back some? What, what adjustments were made by Lane Kiffin that caused this problem? Uh, you know... If that's the case, you know, was Ryan Day outcoached by Lane Kiffin? Because if he was outcoached by Lane Kiffin, that kind of worries me moving down the schedule as better coaches approach. I personally think that we dialed it back some. I don't – Kiffin's a good coach, don't get me wrong. But I don't think – even though it's Ryan Day's first real stint, I don't think he's as good as Day is. 
he made some nice adjustments defensively, but personally, I think that it was just our O line kind of dialed it back some. Justin Fields could have made some better reads, some better decisions, but ultimately, I I, I liked what I saw. Uh, you know, the running game wasn't what we thought it would be. You know, as far as J.K. Dobbins like owning it, but they game planned around him. They were going to make everyone else beat them. J.K. Dobbins still had 91 yards. That's a good day. You know, I think he had 21 carries, so that's uh, somewhere around the four yard per carry average mark. Not bad, but there's some room to improve. Yeah, you know, I, I I was blessed to have the opportunity to go to the game, and it was almost like the start of the game was just. It was like Dwayne Haskins had never left. It just felt it just felt like last year. Like everything was still the same. Except our defense was playing much, much better. Um and then like you said, you know, you it was it coaching, was it the players, you know, was it Lane Kiffin's adjustments? I want to say yes, yes, and yes. It was all the above, I think. Now, I want to I I kind of forewarned everybody of this. Florida Atlantic is not bad. These are Florida ath- athletes, okay? Um, the kid that got hurt, the running back, that's that's a transfer from Alabama, okay? That's a four-star athlete. Th- these guys, the quarterback was a transfer from Oklahoma, okay? If he was good enough to get recruited by Oklahoma, <clears throat> that's a good quarterback. These are not bad athletes. There are only two teams on their schedule that are ranked – is us and their next next week when they play UCF, which they will lose as well. Outside of that, they might not lose another game. Now, there, there's some tough ones on their schedule. Middle Tennessee State, Southern Miss, those are some tough games. But they are, they're, they're going to win more than they lose, and they are going to compete for the Conference USA crown. So that was not a bad team we beat. Now, I'm not saying it was great by any means. It's not a top 25 football team, but... That was not a bad team, Aaron. No, no, they're they're not terrible by any means. They're just, I feel like, uh, you know, based on talent on paper, it should have been a much worse beating. We we could have definitely laid it on them much more. I I honestly, based on those first four drives we had, we should have probably scored up in the 60s or 70s. But again, they're not bad. We laid back a little bit, it seemed, and that kind of that, that's just how it played out. Yeah, um, you know, I I predicted, I believe it was 56 to 17, I believe is what I said. Yeah. Um, I believe you said 56 10. Yeah, I mean, I was expecting more offensively. I think we could, we really should have gotten more offensively. I also think the coaches were trying some things out here a little bit. When you jump up like that, maybe you, you know, I think maybe they do some things a little different. There was some formations and things in the second half that I've not seen Ohio State run since Cooper was here. OK, <laughs> so when when you see the quarterback go under center and there's three tight ends, when's the last time we've seen that happen? You know, yeah. um, there was they were <laughs> they were doing some different things and trying some different things out. So I think there was a little bit of how do I wonder how this looks, you know. Uh, going on there with the coaching staff but you know my my initial reaction was okay there's some things to be excited about but there's a lot of question marks here as well and for our first game of the year we won we won comfortably Um, we didn't blow them out but we won comfortably but you look at some of the other games around college football there was some scary stuff happening I mean there were four SEC teams that got beat in week one When's the last time you could say that, you know? So and I'm sure we'll talk about that at, in the next podcast later in the week. But point being is some funky things can happen in week one if you're not careful. And thankfully, we came out and had a tremendous first quarter because for the next three quarters, there were some funky things that happened. Now, what's great about this, Aaron, is this gives the coaching staff a lot of tape to use to coach with. And I know you being having a background in coaching, what is the benefit of getting some things on tape that are like some obvious holes, weaknesses, mistakes that now you can attack? Well, you see people's tendencies and and that's that's a lot of it. That, that's film is where you get the chance to coach people up and it can be a tedious process. But, you know, with a budget the size of Ohio State, they've got guys, they've got technology 
pull them all in a room and start pointing out issues and coach them up from there. Then you get back on the practice field and fix it physically. Nice. Um, we asked uh, on our Facebook page what your initial reaction was. Um, uh, Charles Sherman, Sherman, longtime listener, a big follower on our Facebook page. He said, a work in progress. Justin Fields' potential was off the charts. Jeremy Ruckert showed why he was coveted by the staff. Offensive line showed that when they were engaged, they were very effective. I really like that line, by the way, Charles. I think that's a great way to describe how effective they were when they were doing well. Mm-hmm. Clock management wasn't good. Ran the clock down a lot. Good thing they now have game film because now the real coaching begins. Not flawless, but man, this team is going going to really be fun to watch. I couldn't agree more, Charles. I think that was a great sentiment by you and a great comment. Sean Ball said, the main thing I saw was the lack of pre-reading by the quarterback and the offensive line. I'm picking up the blitz, but other than that, other than that, defensive tackle better and flew to the ball. I thought play calling was a little shaky at times, but it's only the first game. I wish our coaches would have kept their foot on the pedal and put up 50. I agree, Sean. I think they did take their foot off the pedal a little bit there. Um, But, yes, you mentioned uh, not seeing the blitzes coming. When Lane and his defensive coordinator made the adjustment defensively after the first quarter, and by the way, it uh, it was hilarious to watch happen because when we scored Aaron, it was literally three and out. The defense was back on. and It's like the the coaching staff for Florida Atlantic was like, holy crap, we don't even have time to catch our breaths here. And then we do it right again and again and again. They had no time to make any adjustments in the first quarter. So we just – we were really fortunate that when we scored, our defense gave us a bunch of three and outs right away because they couldn't make any adjustments until the second quarter. Once they made some defensive adjustments, we didn't counter adjust very well, I don't think. That's a concern of mine. One of which was when they started calling up some blitzes and dialing up some blitzes from linebackers and a couple safeties and even a corner blitz or two, our offensive line was not reading that very well at all. And Justin, and, and we'll get into this in the next segment here, but Justin um, is uncomfortable when people are flying at him, um, where Dwayne would he would position himself in the pocket step up into the pocket and go to his second, third, and even fourth options and then throw the ball. Justin is, I'm uncomfortable, and his tendency is, I need to get out of here. That's something the team's got to work on, I think. Do you want to make a comment on that before we move on here? Yeah, I I was going to say, as as far as picking up a blitz, you know, Florida Atlantic kind of a – they were running a 3-4 there for a while, and they were doing some zone blitzes. So, I mean, there was times where they'd show blitz and then drop eight. So that's kind of hard to account for, if you know what I mean. Because if they're showing blitz and then they drop, it's kind of like, okay. You know, that that can throw a quarterback, especially a guy like Fields who doesn't have a ton of game experience really – what do you look for? You know what I mean? I've never played quarterback, so I can't really go in depth on this, but I can imagine that'd be a a difficult read to make. And that's, I think that's what we saw there uh, as far as the uncomfortability, because you see guys showing blitz and then they drop. So you're thinking they're going to do it again and then they send guys. And so it, it can be confusing and it, it, you know, him being a running quarterback, I think that's to be expected. And that's that's probably part of other than his athleticism, why he's a, a, a running quarterback, a dual threat. So, you know, it's it's one of those things where game experience comes into play game film. Now, you know, now they've got something to show them. Hey, next time you see a three, four and they're doing this, you can adjust to this. It, you know, it, that's that's one of the benefits of game film. Right. Not only was it Justin Fields first start, but that was also Josh Myers first start start at center. And those two have to be in tandem when it's they're calling out the blitzes. Yes. So this is a work in progress here for these guys. This was only their first game, not just together, but each each one of them. This was their first start. So uh, let's you know, let's let's uh, understand that this is going to be a work in progress for these guys. It's only going to get better. Um, Daryl Stein, they have some work to do. Not shabby for game one. We've seen worse. I agree, Daryl, completely. We have seen worse. Um, again, 
not shabby, but you know, we've got some work to do. One more here. This is from Debbie Shade. Great game. They have some things to work on both offensively and defensively. And then she says, little worried about Cincinnati next week. Debbie, we are going to be talking about that in our midweek podcast. We're going to be talking all about the Bearcats. Guys, this game is for real. And I would not be surprised if Luke Fickle comes in here and not only gives us one heck of a game, um, but this could be, if my prediction is right, and Luke Fickle ends up going to a Big Ten East team after the end of the season as a new head coach, this could be the big rival for Ryan Day in the future when it comes to head coaches. Um, so keep that in mind. This this could be something big here this week beyond just the game. Uh, and we'll talk about that, like I said, in the next podcast. But uh, thank you guys for commenting and giving us your two cents. Uh, we really appreciate that. Let's talk about Justin Fields now a little bit. Um, what grade do you give him for his first start and the offense as a whole for this game when it comes to Justin Fields, his performance, and the offense as a whole? What grade would you give them? Uh, Justin Fields, I'm going to go ahead and give him a B-. And that's because he went 18 of 25 for 234 and four touchdowns. Very impressive. He also had 12 carries for 61 yards, although one, yeah, 51 of those yards came in one carry for a touchdown. Now, there were times receivers weren't open and defenders were closing in, as we discussed, and he would take a sack instead of throwing the ball away. That's And, the, and that, I think that's just game experience, and I think he'll pull it together. He's a smart kid, and I, I think he'll improve that this week. Um, you know, he also seemed a bit timid about throwing the ball over the middle, um, unless it was like super wide open, as was the case when apparently FAU didn't have a safety back and Chris Olave caught a touchdown pass. Although he did run a nice route, I will say that. Um, the offense overall, I'm minus that first quarter, I've got to give them a C. They, they were extremely average for three quarters of this football game. They only had, I think, 469 yards total. I think they should have had closer to 600 if they had had, you know, kept playing the way they did in the first quarter. Uh, you know, whether it was effort or skill, there's some things to work on with the line. K.J. Hill was pretty much MIA. I think he only had three receptions for 21 yards. Austin Mack had a couple good grabs, but really I'm not sure he had over 30 yards. Uh, Benjamin Victor did okay. Uh, two receptions, one touchdown. Chris Olave did well. Um, but for me, I think the big thing was Jeremy Ruckert. He came in and uh, he made a splash. With Rashad Berry not playing, he got his opportunity and he showed up. And I think he, you know, he was a bright spot for me personally. I like to see that. He was a highly touted recruit and he came in and did his thing uh, yesterday. Yeah, that was that was that was nice um, for me. I'm going to go for Justin Fields. I'm going to go B minus. I'm right there with you. He did some really nice things. Um, he OK. Couple observations. He's not just fast, guys. He's smooth. Mm -hmm. When he when he runs, it looks like he's not even trying. It's like effortless. Like a and gazelle. He's just, <laughs> he's just running by everybody. You know, you, these guys are just like you can just see him. They're like grimacing as they're running, trying to catch him. And he's just kind of like it's a walk in a park. So that's there's there's fast and then there's like gifted fast. He's gifted fast. That's the first thing. Second thing, um, you are right. He was hesitant to throw over the middle. You mentioned that there were receivers that weren't open. There were a lot of receivers that were wide open. He just didn't see them. Um, and, and I know that's hard to see on TV because um, you're only getting you know a portion of what you're of the field when you're watching on television. When you're at the game and you're and you're concentrating on things like that, you can see the whole field. So one of the things that Dwayne was really good at last year was he would throw to a spot and expecting the receiver to be there because his timing was so well. Justin hasn't developed that yet. And so there was receivers who looked covered, but if he would throw it two or three steps where they need to be in that split second, they would have been open in the middle of the field on those, on those crossing routes. And he was just hesitant to throw those. And so what he would do is he, oh, they're not open. And then he, he like gets out of the pocket or rolls out of the pocket to try to give himself more time. Um, and so he's, 
it, it looked almost like it was a busted play when if he would just stay in the pocket and deliver the ball on time to that window that you know would be there it would be a completion and the, and the and the receiver would have a step and he could take off that's going to come with time again again this is the first time in a real game so this isn't a controlled environment here where where Ryan Day can you know can can dial up the defense to make sure that that uh, Justin gets the perfect defense to throw those plays on um, that's not happening now, okay? This is a real game with a real defense that's trying to stop him. So it's going to take some time. This was, again, his first collegiate start. Uh, and it's been, you know, two years since he's really played a game as a starting quarterback. And the last time he did so, Aaron, was against high school linebackers and defensive backs, okay? Totally different world that he is in right now. And let's keep in mind, okay, that he is one year younger right now than what Dwayne Haskins was last year. Yes, Dwayne was a sophomore, but he was a redshirt sophomore. It means he was his third year in college. This is only Justin's second year in college. There's, that's one more full year of development that Dwayne Haskins had. Plus, he had one full year with Ryan Day before he became the starter. Justin's, Justin has had basically six months. So let's give him some time here with the understanding that it's going to get better. So my initial grade is B minus. You passed. You did good. You got good stats. You had a great start, but you got some things to work on. Offensively as a whole, I'm going to stick right there at B minus. I saw a lot of bright spots like you mentioned, and I saw some spots that where I was like, eh, we need to get a little better with that. And so I'm going to go ahead and say B minus with the caveat that now that they've got tape, this coaching staff's going to coach these guys up. Those are my two cents. Yeah, I uh, I can't disagree with you on the bright spots. There's definitely that. It's just for me, the, it's just the O-line just looks so average. I'm sorry. I just can't get past it. I, I do think they're going to improve drastically this week because, honestly, they're going to have to. Cincinnati's going to bring it. They're absolutely going to bring it. Luke Fickle is a heck of a head coach. He's got some talent down there in Cincinnati. Now that there's film of us out there, and you know, now that I think out loud, I'm thinking maybe, you know, we saw a lot of the three tight ends and, you know, a lot of tight end usage, which we're not used to, by the way. I'm sure a lot of people noticed that, but I'm thinking maybe Ryan Day didn't want to give away his game plan all the way, especially against a, a much inferior opponent like FAU. So maybe we'll see the playbook open up a little bit this week against Cincinnati. We're going to coach him up through the week on some things that need improved and then add some things and, uh, I, I, you know, see how it plays out next week. Yeah. It should be interesting to see what kind of wrinkles we see out of this offense, because if there's one thing that Ryan day has been consistent about in, in, in him and Kevin Wilson, when they, when they've been interviewed the last few years, it's that we always build off of what we have just done offensively. They have been saying that for years now. So when we we do A next after A, we're now going we now have A and B, and then after A and B, we now have A, B, and C that we can do. And so the defenses are constantly trying to are, are constantly one two steps behind what we're doing offensively. So we'll see what kind of wrinkles now we throw at the Bearcats next week based off of what we did offensively against FAU. One of the one of the parts of the offense, Aaron, that um, a lot of people seem weary of, and I'm going to be honest, I'm one of them too, is our running game. Um, is our running game okay, or is there an issue with our running game right now? And is it the offensive line, or is it the running backs, or maybe both? I mean, Lane Kiffin came right out and said they were going to game plan around stopping J.K. Dobbins, you know? So I, I think that had a part to play in it big time when, you know, you're game planning around one guy to stop them and you're forcing, you're forcing Justin Fields to beat you. That's, that plays a factor. I mean, he still had 21 carries for 91 yards and a touchdown 4.3 yard average. That's not bad people. That's not bad at all. It's, I mean, I, I guess a lot of people would consider it average. Now I know the expectation is he probably should have had 150 yards. I understand. Cause I was hoping for that myself. But, you know, he still almost had 100 yards. It was an average day. But Dobbins was still effective despite subpar line play. And I hate to keep coming back and trying to blame the line. I don't mean to sound like that guy. But it was just so so glaring to me that they had an issue up front. Um, 
I believe we're okay on account. I think the line did dial it back some. Uh, we had 239 total rush yards, and that's a that's a pretty solid day. I don't care. That's that's a very solid day as a team. 239 rush yards. Um, to me, watching Dobbins, he seemed more sure of where he was going with the ball. Now, in years past, he kind of danced a little bit, but he seemed more authoritative uh, running the ball. Uh, he did fumble once, but uh, you know I'm going to go ahead and blame that on first game jitters. <laughs> Uh, you got to realize this is his third season. He's been extremely dangerous, posting back-to-back 1,000-yard seasons. So, you know, not just FAU, but down the schedule, you're going to see teams game planning around him, and it's going to be a little more difficult for him to get those yards. And then when you take away the fact he's had Mike Weber uh, to kind of supplement or compliment him, that hurts. Now, I will say this, and a, a bright spot, I'd like to mention, in addition to Ruckert, is Master Teague. I really liked what I saw out of him. I'm a believer. And honestly, after yesterday's game, now, Demario McCall kind of got dinged up. I don't know what the deal is there, uh, if he's going to be missing any time or or what. But I think Master Teague is a gamer. He got eight carries and got 49 yards out of that. He runs downhill, and he's physical. I really like that. Um Now, out of the shotgun, we have to get better at the read option, and that's an experience thing, and that is going to come in time, as we've discussed. A lot of the things that we're talking about are things that are going to come in time, watching film and really working on it through the week. Yeah, I've watched about three-fourths of the game um, this morning and and today before we recorded, and we're recording here on uh, Sunday, September 1st. Um, so there were at least three to four times he made the wrong read on the read option Mm -hmm. and gave JK the ball and JK's got nowhere to go because they're not, you know, they're zoning in on him, um, where if he would have kept it, he probably would have done well, but I don't know that that's necessarily not what they coached him to do to try to keep him safe here early on. Uh, agree so yeah mm. i think again we need to we need to dial that back a little bit here um and th- the next thing is i agree with you i've been big master T- on master t ever since we recruited him i like him and i got a great story about this so uh, i was at the game aaron and i'm with my buddy carl and we're getting uh, a coke and we're doing the whole new uh uh by the way this this is a great thing now their collective cups that they give at the shoe, they're they're eight dollars. They're expensive, but here's Ooh. what's awesome: you get free refills for the entire game. Oh, that makes up for it. Oh right yeah, there. absolutely. That's excellent. Where a bottle of Coke on D deck, just a, just a plastic bottle of Coke's five dollars, and you can't refill that one. So get the collective <laughs> cup and get yourself some refills d- during the game. It, it's great. I I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. As far as uh, Master Teague is concerned, we're getting a Coke, we're getting filling up. I go, hey, Carl, I go, that's Master Teague's dad. He goes, what? I go, yeah, they're all wearing Teague shirts and jerseys. So I got to go up, and I said, let's go introduce ourselves. So Carl walks up to him, and I walk up to him after I finish filling up my Coke, introduce myself. It is indeed uh, Master Teague's dad, and um, what a great guy. I mean, dude was awesome. Aaron, he carried his Bible into the stadium with him. That's the kind of family Master Teague comes from. He is all about his faith, and he's all about his family, and he tries so hard. And I asked his dad, I goes, is he all right, everything good? I know he was beat up. He goes, he gave me a thumbs up. He goes, oh, he's been good for a couple weeks. Don't you worry. And then he gets into the game, and he, <clears throat> and he tears it up, dude. All right, so here's what I like about him. Outside of the kind of person he is, and I know that's personal here, you might some of our listeners might not feel the same way as I do about things like that. But when he runs the football, he falls forward. He's always gaining yards. Even that one play when he goes around the corner and the guy goes to take his feet out and he leaps over him, dives and gets two or three additional yards with the dive and gets the first down. That's Ezekiel Elliott type of things that we haven't had since Zeke left. It's fighting and falling forward and always moving your legs and getting those extra one, two, three yards. I feel sometimes J.K. doesn't do that. I feel like J.K., when he 
gets hit, excuse me, when he gets hit, he goes down. Yeah, I he's a hungry runner, Master Teague is. I, every and every yard counts, and he knows that. And he's going to get every inch going forward that he possibly can. And I, honest to God, really look forward to seeing him run the ball more this year. I think he's going to have a huge impact. And the way that he's built, he's a monster. He is a monster. We have two running backs that look like they're NFL backs. Like, I'm excited. You know, I wasn't completely sold on him before the year started, to be perfectly honest about it. Now I'm a believer, and I am rooting for this kid. And here's what's great. He's he's, he's one of the fastest guys on the team. He's faster yeah. than J.K., mm-hmm. believe it or not, even though he's built like a tank. So, I, all right, here's my thing, and I'm going to be writing about this if I have time this week. Here's here's my thing, and I, I, I dare someone to tell me I'm wrong right now, okay? J.K. Dobbins is J.T. Barrett at running back. <laughs> What an interesting comparison. Tell me I'm wrong. He's from Texas, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. From Texas. He's going to have all the stats in the world. Okay. In fact, if he doesn't go pro at the end of this year, it comes back. He'll probably be the all-time leading rusher in Ohio State history, just like JT's all-time leading passer in Ohio State history. But yet, when you say he's the greatest running back of all time, you're no one's going to say J.K. Dobbins. I mean – I wish him all the luck in his future. I hope he becomes an excellent pro back. But point is, he's at Ohio State right now, and I am a major college football fan. I'm not – I do like the Steelers. Don't hate me for that, people. <laughs> but, um, you know, for the time being, he's still in Columbus. So as far as I'm concerned, he can get all – he can 1,000 yards for the next two years if he wants to come back for an extra year if he gets hurt or something like that, which I hope doesn't happen, by the way. But uh, – I'm okay with that. I will recognize him till the cows come home. Just you know, just like I do JT Barrett. I'm okay with that. They're doing excellent things at Ohio State, and that's why I'm cheering for him. I again, I hope he does big things in the pros, provided that he makes it. But right now, he's in Columbus, and right now, he's our starting back, and I am all in on him. Yeah, I want JK to have. I think sometimes we miss the explosiveness that Zeke had. Yeah. And JK's missing that gear. It's like he's stuck in second and third gear a lot. Don't get me wrong, second and third gear running backs can win you a lot of football games. Okay. They're good backs. Um he's he's going to play in the NFL. He's going to be a solid backup in the NFL. I just don't know that he you know, he's not he's not a superstar. I watched uh Taylor from Wisconsin Friday night. And I'm like, I'm like salivating over the guy. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this dude's amazing. You know, and and JK just doesn't have that gear in him. Can he get there? Can it happen? I don't know. I mean, I'm rooting for him just like you. I'm just like, I was rooting for JT Barrett. Um, but when I, when Jake, when JK runs the ball, I'm, I'm going to start, I'm, I'm going to call it right now. You're going to have more and more Buckeye fans, just like when JT was quarterback, Calling for that backup that's not getting as many carries. And when he gets into the game, he does really well. And it's like, why is it this guy playing? You know, we're going to start to see those things maybe. Yeah, I think, you know, having Mike Weber complimenting him at running back, I think that helped him out a lot because they had to game plan for two dangerous running backs. So, you know, you couldn't just go with one. So it's kind of like they had to really pay attention to who was on the field. And so I think Master Teague's going to benefit in that way as well with J.K. Dobbins moving forward. But I think Master Teague might have that extra gear. I've not really seen J.K. Dobbins in the open field, like running. He's more of an east-west runner. He likes to juke and jive, and I'm okay with that. Makes for uh, memorable moments, quite frankly. You know, Barry Sanders was like that, but the difference is Barry Sanders had open field speed. If he got open, you weren't catching him. I'm not so sure J.K. Dobbins has that that gear, if that you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, Master Teague, I think he might have the potential to have that. Right. I, I think so. I think the, I think so. All right. That's enough about offense. We got. We'll, we'll talk about the, uh, our offensive game plan heading into Cincinnati midweek, Aaron. Let's talk about defense now. 
your defensive grade and my next question are the silver bullets back okay so there's some things to talk about here and i'm excited because i loved what i saw <laughs> so i'm gonna go ahead and give them i'm gonna give them an a minus and as far as the silver bullets being back i think it's too early to tell but they are definitely trending in the right direction the linebackers looked comfortable, they were aggressive, and they got to the ball super fast. I really loved that. And then the fact, like, they had – FAU had negative yardage in the first half. I think it was like negative 14 or something. That's insane. That's insane. How do you hold a team to negative yardage? That's crazy. I loved what I saw. Um, Chase Young was killing people. Jordan Fuller led the team in tackles with seven – uh, we had four sacks as a defensive unit, and I believe Chase Young had one and a half of those, although I feel like it probably should have been two. Uh, but that's st that's statistician's job, not mine. But either way, um, my only concern, and this is why they got an A-, minus, and this isn't really on the players necessarily, but my concern is how easily FAU went down the field with an up-tempo offense. Seemed like FAU struggled in the red zone, OK, which that's on them, but a better team will not. Now, you know, um, let me think here. Teams that go up tempo on us that are highly skilled compared to FAU, what's that going to look like on us? You know, and then our coverage has had some holes in it that, a, you know, a, a better coach team that has better skilled players, they're going to expose that. So, again, this goes back to the film room. We're going to look at that. And they're going to get coached up, and we're going to fix that. And, and each game plan is going to be different for each team because they're all different, obviously. So, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and give an A- on the on the day. Great. Um, I am going to give B+. Plus. I thought it was really good. I thought it was an A- plus in the first half, uh, to be honest yes. with you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I saw a lot of good things from this defense. Um, here's the thing, guys. What's the la What has been our Achilles heal the last two years it's losing the game that we're not expecting and we can't stop them iowa just destroys our defense right purdue just kills our defense last year the the type of scheme that that we are now running at ohio state defensively will make sure that doesn't happen now we will give up some yards because we're running a heck of a lot of zone now mm -hmm. and so we will give up some yards between the 20s it's kind of like a trestle defense is what it feels like a little bit. We'll bend, but we're not going to break, and we're going to keep our team in the game no matter what. Is that a good trade-off? I think so. I mean, it's a whole heck of a lot better than what we saw last year, isn't it? I'll take it over losing to Purdue. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, are the silver bullets back? I'm right there with you, Aaron. Let's wait and see. I saw some things I liked. They had Barrett Browning in there a lot defensively. He and he. Well. He did well. He he did very well. Um, in fact, he played just as much as um, Tough Borland did. So even though Borland, you know, gets credit for being the starter of the game, uh, Browning was in there just as much as Borland was. And so I think that's interesting. I think we might see more and more of, 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 of Browning than Borland as the season goes along. What was surprising to me was how much they had Pete Warner playing. He played almost the entire football game. And he did some really good things, but he also um, he also had a tough matchup. Okay, guys, like their tight ends, Florida Atlantic tight ends are 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 they have an NFL tight end on their team. Okay, and I, I told everybody this going into the game. Their best player was their tight end, and we saw it because their tight ends basically were their entire offense. Um, our corners just shut out their wide receivers the entire game. Okuda uh, played phenomenal. That one where he was on a soft coverage and it was like a back shoulder fade and he comes diving in to not, uh, to, to uh, deflect the ball, I believe it was like on the, on the second or third drive, was just phenomenal. That was a total athletic play. And Ar Arnett played well. Did, did we ever call – did you ever hear his name called where he got, bl got, got blown out, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. Not not the entire game. He played really, really well. Where we struggled was trying to cover those tight ends. And I told you guys this that's 
this is what we were going to face. And Lane Kiffin was going to try to use his best players against us. And we didn't do a, a great job of starting, uh, stopping those tight ends. But not all of that is on the linebackers because they had Sean Wade uh, covering the tight end most of the game, which is a total mismatch when you look at height, you know. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll, we'll we'll see what we do with you know how that goes. But I don't know that I'm completely comfortable with uh, uh, Warner out there covering wide receivers and tight ends. You know, like a, like a defensive back uh, when he's supposed to be our our other outside linebacker. I don't I don't know about that one. But we'll see how this you know this team adjusts moving forward because obviously they now have some tape as well uh, defensively on things they need to need to work on. But quite frankly, I'm I'm pretty happy with the defense. Yeah. I mean, how could you be upset about negative yardage in the first half? And I, I mean, you know, I think they gave up like somewhere in the 250 yard range uh, for the game. But goodness gracious, that's I'm, I'll take that. I will take that. A lot of teams do that in the first half. We did. We allowed it for the whole game. And as far as Pete Werner goes, I I'm a track nerd. I ran track in high school, too. Um, he's not slow. He's not super fast, but he's not slow either. He ran a 51 point, I think, four second, 400 meter. That's pretty respectable, especially out of a guy his size. And then I think his 200 time was like 23.9, which is not super fast either, but it's respectable for a guy his size. Again, what needs to be worked on is his coverage skills and I mean, I think he gets the job done tackling and stopping the run. I, I remember seeing him in there and on just about all the run plays. Yeah. But his coverage skills need some work, and it's not that he can't do it. I think he just needs coached up on it. Nothing wrong with that. It'll come in time, and I think we got the, you know, Al Washington's going to get him to that point. And I think you're going to see better and better and better linebacker play as the year progresses. Um, I have a man crush on Jeffrey Okuda. That dude can play football. Yeah. And I played corner and safety, and I like that kid. He can play some ball. I like his breaking skills. I mean, he was in a bail technique and still made a break to, to you know, make a deflection. That's hard to do. That He's an NFL corner. He's yes, going to he be an NFL corner, and I'm excited to see him and how much better he gets as the year goes. Yeah, I remember you You mentioned Pete Warner stopping the run. There was a play um, during the game where the running back for Florida Atlantic, I don't know if it was James Charles or Larry Mc, McCammon, was coming around the left end, and someone was – basically he met uh, one of our linebackers and was kind of being held up, and Pete comes running across the field and just lit the guy up. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was a monster hit, and I was like, oh, okay. Like, he, he's not afraid of contact, guys, you know. He's just being used differently, I think, than than maybe what we're used accustomed to a linebacker being used at Ohio State. So, give it some time. Let's see how it works before we, you know, we bail on the guy. But uh, yeah, as far as Okuda is concerned, uh, I'm right there with you. Uh, um, I'm very, very high on Okuda, and um, I think he is by far the best defensive back on our team. Yeah, uh, him and Jordan Fuller, I think they're going to have good years or a good year. All right, so there's there's a little bit of defensive talk. So let's go ahead and go into our next segment. Let's hand out some Buckeye leaves. Why doesn't Ohio State put a logo on their helmets? Because they'd rather cover it with your misery. Block by block. Hit by hit. Score by score. Football is art, and the helmet is their canvas. I'll tell you why Ohio State doesn't put a logo on their helmets because it would get in the way of their masterpiece. All right, Aaron. So something new that we're going to do this year is we're going to hand out Buckeye leaves to our, our top players and top uh, playmakers during the, the games. Let's start by going with the uh, defensive play of the game or hit of the game. I'll let you go first. Okay, so I'm going to go with Malik Harrison's hit on the running back. He just ate that kid. He was I, – I can't remember. I think it was first quarter, somewhere near the end. They went I, – I don't think it was a draw play. It might have been like a lead play, and Malik was just there and just destroyed his day. 
Yeah, I'm also I'm also going with Malik Harrison. I was glad I, when I was watching the tape, I kept remembering this play. I thought it was in the first quarter. It actually happened near the end of the third quarter. Um, the the tight end, the really good tight end for Florida Atlantic, and his name is is um, I lost his name in my mind here. I'll see if I can't think of it in a second. But um, a Bryant Harrison, I think is uh, or, or is this or Harrison Bryant maybe is his name. Uh, he came he came over the middle and. And the quarterback kind of uh, didn't do do him any favors because he just he kind of hung him out the dry, and and Malik just lit his world on fire, stuck stuck his shoulder right into his chest and drove him backwards and and the, separated him from the football for an incomplete pass. That was one heck of a defensive play and a defensive hit. Um, that's one that the receivers for Cincinnati, as they were watching this game, probably all went, ooh, might want to think different about going over the middle when Malik's in town. So, uh, yeah, big hit there from Malik Harrison. That was my defensive play of the game or my hit of the game. How about your offensive play of the game? Uh, I'm going to go with the 51-yard touchdown by Justin Fields. That got the, the nerves calmed down for the game for him. It opened up scoring, uh, and it started our fourth – four touchdown uh, lead there. And I, I just, I really liked how the play developed. He made the right read and he just took off on everybody with that incendiary speed. Nice. I'm going with the next touchdown, which was the 25 yard pass or Justin Fields first pass. This one was to sophomore Jeremy Rucker, his first touchdown as a Buckeye. What a beautiful play that was. Now what made it beautiful for me is it was a two tight end set on the left side of the, of the field. OK, so they're on the left side of the hash, two tight ends. You're expecting one to stay back and block. They both go out in motion and uh, they they cross one another. And when they cross one another, both defenders follow the one going to the outside, leaving Rucker wide open in the middle of the field for a touchdown. I love that play. That's just a beautiful coaching play where you're coaching your players up. And, and the, the quarterback has the time. That's when he had a clean pocket. He had the time for the play to develop, watch the play develop, who was going to be open, threw a beautiful ball, Rucker wide open, big touchdown, we're up 14-0. And at that moment, I was like, okay, this is for real. He's not only just a runner, look at that arm. That was great. To me, that was the offensive play of the game. It sure was a nice play, no question. All right, how about your defensive player of the game? I'm going to go with Malik Harrison again. He had five tackles, one sack, and two for a loss. I thought that he stepped up. He was very physical, and that's what we need a linebacker. Nice. Yes, very, very good. I'm going to go with Jeffrey Okuda as my player, defensive player of the game. He had six tackles total, four solo. He had the um, he had a forced fumble. He also had a breakup that, I, that we talked about that was gorgeous. Jeffrey Okuda is a shutdown corner. Um, that was my pl- that was my defensive player of the game. How about your offensive player of the game? I, you know, as much as I liked what I saw out of uh, you know a lot of the skilled players, I'm gonna go ahead and go with the obvious, Justin Fields, 18 of 25, 234 yards, four touchdowns through the air, one on the ground. Uh, he had 12 carries for 61 yards. He matched the production of Dwayne Haskins' first game as a starter. Couldn't ask for much more than that. Nice. I'm going with Chris Olave, wide receiver, four t- four uh, catches, 59 yards and a touchdown. Should have been five catches because that offensive pass interference they called on him was bull crap. Um, I know he extended his arm, but he did not push that guy at all. Um, anyways, Chris Olave is just fluid. He looks great out there. And you mentioned his route running. It's it's the best on the team. There's no doubt about it. He knows how to run routes. And he is going to be a focal point of this offense. Um, I Obviously, JK, uh, uh, K.J. Hill gets a lot of attention. And obviously, Benjamin Victor is getting a lot of snaps as well at the one. Um, he looked good as well. But I'll, other than those two, Chris Olave is out there the most as a receiver. Um, so... I really like what I saw from Chris Olave. I think he had a great start to the season. This was a perfect start for him coming off the big game against Michigan and in the Rose Bowl. What would we see from Chris Olave after a full off season in this in this program? Uh, we're, what we're seeing is he's going to be a star. 
that's what we're seeing. Chris Olave, player of the game for me offensively, four catches, 59 yards, and a touchdown. So there are your Buckeye leaves this week. So a couple for Malik Harrison, Jeffrey Okuda, uh, Justin Fields, uh, Chris Olave, uh, Jeremy Ruckard, they all get some Buckeye leaves slapped on their helmets this week. Great job, guys. All right, let's go ahead and now let's talk about the Big Ten. Aaron, go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and lead the discussion here on how the other Big Ten teams fared in their opening games this season. Overall, the Big Ten had an excellent day. Uh, the season opened up with Purdue and Nevada. Now, this this was a, a low point for the Big Ten. I think Purdue should have won that game, but too many mistakes. Nevada ended up pulling it out at the end of the game on a last-second field goal, 34 to 31. And we move on to Penn State, who rolled over Idaho as expected. They scored 79 points and only allowed seven. And then Maryland, Maryland, yes, that Maryland, played Howard and scored 79 points, one shy of a school record. That was impressive. That was Howard, however, okay? (laughs) Of course, of course. But still, it takes a lot of effort to put up 79 points. We'll know how good Maryland (laughs) is this upcoming week because they play Syracuse. So that'll that'll be a good game now. Yeah, I think that'll be a a nice measuring stick for them. Pretty similar. So, all right. Uh, Michigan State, they looked pretty impressive. Now, it was Tulsa, uh, but they won 28-7 at home. And then the bottom feeders, Illinois, ended up scoring a lot of points over Akron. It's 42 to 3. And I do realize that it's Akron. But when I think Illinois, I think like they're, if they moved over to the MAC, they'd probably be pretty much on par. <laughs> they're not very impressive. So, you know, maybe they've got some, uh, some serious improvement over the offseason. Maybe Lovey Smith's got them, uh, got them clicking right now. But, you know, 42 3, we'll see how how the season ends up for them. Uh, Michigan struggled early with middle Tennessee state, but ended up pulling that one out 40 to 21. And then the other bottom dwellers Rutgers, uh, they ended up beating UMass 48, 21. Iowa takes out Miami, Ohio, 38 to 14. Wisconsin looked very impressive, very impressive. Uh, they traveled down to South Florida and shut them out 49 to nothing. Their running back was he was on point, as you mentioned earlier, on point. Uh, Nebraska struggled. They they struggle bust hard the whole day on offense. They had no offensive touchdowns. All of their points came via uh, special teams or defense against South Alabama. Come on. 38 to tw- or 35, 21 victory at home. Um, I'm pretty sure Scott Frost is upset about that. Stanford downs Northwestern 17-7. I picked Northwestern, mm-hmm. um, and honestly, it was uh, it was a defensive struggle for most of the first half. I watched three quarters of this game, and turnovers and injuries are what hurt Northwestern. Right. Um, unfortunately, their quarterback play was kind of lackluster. Uh, they ran the ball pretty decent, but Stanford just had too much for him yesterday. Uh, Minnesota struggled against South Dakota State, but they ended up winning 28-21. Now, South Dakota State is a uh, upper echelon FCS school. Yes, they very, are. Very, very impressive team, uh, and they they gave Minnesota all they wanted, so they you know they almost pulled off the upset. If I'm not mistaken, they lost Minnesota lost to North Dakota State a few years ago. So yeah, uh, they get they beat the South, but I'm pretty sure they lost to North Dakota State maybe four or five years ago. In, a, in shocking fashion as well. So, yeah, those Dakota schools are really good. So you, you, you can't sleep on them. Yes, yes. And I think that Carson Wentz uh, of the Eagles was the quarterback uh, when they beat Minnesota, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong on that. But that's you – know, North Dakota State's won like – they've either won or played in like seven straight FCS championship games. Yeah. Like they're, they're pretty tough. Yeah. If, uh, you're, if you're from Ohio, they're kind of like the Mount Union – you know, where Mount Union is just like always there in Division Three football. Um, so if you're from Ohio, you'll know what I'm talking about uh, with that comparison. But they're they're always there, like you mentioned. 
Yes, yes, they are. And then to finish out Big Ten play, Indiana defeats Ball State 34-24. So my initial reactions of this, Wisconsin's much better than I thought they were going to be. Yes. Um, That's my big takeaway from this weekend. Wisconsin really, really impressed me. Um, My other big takeaway from this weekend was um, Rutgers (laughs) in Illinois might not be as bad as we thought they were. And holy crap, is Maryland for real? Like, we'll find out. You know, I don't, it is Howard here we're talking about. But, um, yeah, that was some serious firepower coming from Maryland there. And if you if we throw Penn State, Michigan State, Michigan, Ohio State, and now if Maryland's that good, the East is just going to be an absolute brutal, all you know, no holds barred over the top battle royal here. I don't think anybody comes out of the out of the East unscathed if that's if that's the way it's gonna be. Yeah, I think Big Ten East, I think that division's probably the most stacked in college football. And I don't SEC people, I don't care. Talk all that talk you want. I think the Big Ten East is the toughest division in college football right now. Yeah, I I think the Big Ten Big Ten I, just my initial overreaction of week one, the Big Ten is the best conference in, in college football, which means we might not get any team in the playoffs because of it. Or we could be like the SEC, although I don't think we're as favored by ESECPN uh, as much as they are. Um, <laughs> They could, you know, two loss SEC teams tend to get two teams into the playoff every year, and I don't know how that happens, but you know, hopefully the Big Ten can uh, end up in that position someday. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, the SEC is awful weak outside of Georgia and Bama. I mean, it. I didn't see anything. Auburn had a nice comeback, but man, they're flawed offensively. I'm uh, not convinced. Yeah. I, I really don't think Oregon is I, – I don't think Oregon is the 11th ranked team in, in the country. I'm sorry. I no. know they've got some explosive players, and I know they played really well defensively, uh, but I, I, think, I, think they, I think they played well because, you know, Auburn's offense isn't, isn't that good. I think LSU, Texas A&M, Alabama are all better than Auburn. In, I agree in, in the in S, in their division the SEC. So I, I think Auburn's overrated, although their defensive line is pretty good. Okay, yeah. so so looking at our predictions, um, so looking at the predictions uh, in the week one, both Josh and uh, Josh and myself were thirteen and one in our Big Ten predictions. And you were uh, 12 and two, Aaron, in your uh, Big Ten prediction. And of course, these are from a cumulative of as we went through all the teams um, this year. So, uh, so some interesting stuff there to 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 consider as we move forward there with the Big Ten. And of course, we'll be doing our Big Ten power rankings in our next episode. That'll become something we do every single week, midweek. Um, now, as far as the predictions that we made uh, in the other games, um, uh, you and I both predicted Auburn to win. We were both right in that prediction. Um, and then uh, the Stanford Northwestern prediction, Josh and I were both correct. So if you're keeping score at home, Eric's got a one game lead over you, boys. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys got some room to catch up to me a uh, week two is going to be a lot of fun in college football not only does ohio state have a have a big game against the bearcats of cincinnati uh but there are some really good games on the docket uh nationally including lsu texas that's gonna be Ooh. great yeah that one i'm excited for stanford usc play each other in week two We'll find out if Stanford can can capitalize off of their win against uh, Northwestern and, and beat the, the Trojans, or if USC can start to make a march this season, um, or if they're going to make a march for Urban Meyer. I don't know. We'll have to see how that goes for them. Um, but that's going to be a lot of fun. But I'm really looking forward to the LSU-Texas game uh, next week along with the Buckeye game. So, all right, Aaron, it's that time. Why don't you go ahead and give us – your quote of the week and take us out hell that other team can't beat us we got to make sure we don't beat ourselves 
I would like to start out with something that I use in almost every speech, and that is paying forward. Paying forward. And that is the thing that you folks with your great education from here can do for the rest of your life. Today is the greatest day of my life. All right, this quote comes from Ryan Day uh, during the post-game conference. Uh, when asked about pulling Justin Fields up 28 nothing in the first quarter, he had to say, I hope our players don't think what you just said. That worries me a little bit. We score that fast, that many points. These guys have to play, and they have to play until we pull them back. So we're going to address that this week. Great start, but we got to keep going. All right, so you can listen to the weekly show on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, and Podbean. Please like and subscribe to our show on your app of choice, and please consider giving us a five-star review so that the OHIO podcast can continue to grow and reach more great Buckeye fans on a weekly basis. You can contact the show by emailing us at theohiopodcast at gmail.com or by visiting our Facebook page at The Ohio Podcast. You can also follow our Instagram account at The Ohio Podcast. Until next time, OH! I-O! Go Bucks!